Welcome, fellow readers, I'm your host Olivia, and today, we're delving into the captivating world of Sarah J Mass fantasy masterpiece, A Court of Thorns and Roses. We sift through the wealth of customer reviews and carefully select the most compelling and insightful opinions to share with you. Get ready for an in-depth discussion that will take you into the hearts and minds of its most dedicated fans. Anything Faye, and I am in, although I have never read high fantasy before now, so I think I will be exploring all that I can get my hands on. I am rating A Court of Thorns and Roses 5 out of 5 stars because there was not a single thing I disliked about this whole book. I was hooked by the very first page, hooked entirely by Faye. I was so in love with it that I forced my mother to stop reading her current book and start this one. Now I am looking at her eagerly, just waiting for her to agree that it is brilliant and I was right to stop her, as I constantly pester her with, have you met him yet? Have you met Resand? To say I adore him would be putting it lightly. This is technically a young adult novel, but I would recommend A Court of Thorns and Roses to anyone of any age. Do check the full trigger warnings list online, as they include but are not limited to, drugging, kidnapping, physical and emotional abuse, manipulation, and torture. If you love anything fairy, then get this book. If you love adventure, love, and strong female main characters who would do absolutely anything to help others survive, then get this book. Actually, just get this book, read it, and then tell me how much you love Resand. I cannot wait until the next book arrives, as I need, with a burning passion, to know what Faya will do next. Thank you, Sarah J Maas, for creating Faya. I cannot wait to see more of Pridian through her eyes. Wow. Just wow. I've never really considered myself a fan of fantasy novels. I think the last time I read anything fantasy related was when I was roughly 15. Hence why I didn't approach this book when I first saw all the hype on Bookstagram. Although, when I did start to come around to the idea of reading this series, I kept putting it off, because I was scared of it not living up to the hype. That's one of the worst things as a bookstagrammer, but lord did it live up to the hype. I loved this book. I loved it so much. I read it on Audible, and I swear I didn't take my headphones off once. At least not until I had to. I was just hooked from the beginning, I honestly felt like I was living it, and it was over far too soon. I knew that later on in the series, Tamlin becomes a very hated character, so I did tend to listen to everything he did with a pinch of salt. I may have liked him somewhat, but I wasn't crazy about him, and now after having almost finished the series, I simply cannot stand the man. Like all of you. This book, with its magic, fairy tale roots, and steamy hot romance, deserves all of the stars. I loved it. Here are the 5 reasons why I gave A Court of Thorns and Roses 5 out of 5 stars, and then some. Fairy Tale Retelling I was a little wary of this story when I discovered that it was a fairy tale retelling. I loved the story of Beauty and the Beast. Growing up, I watched the Disney version all of the time, but not as much as I watched Pocahontas. However, in the past I have struggled to find enjoyment in Beauty and the Beast retellings. Particularly Beastly by Alex Flynn, I did not enjoy the book or the movie. I think I was worried that A Court of Thorns and Roses wouldn't feel original, but it was the complete opposite. Mars has written an incredibly unique story that is grounded in the fairy tale we all know and love, but is also independent and utter creative genius, Mars is definitely honing and owning her writing skills. Yes, there is a curse, and magic, and a love story. But there is also dark magic, and steamy romance, and I do mean steamy, and blood and gore, and court drama, basically, all of my favorite things wrapped up in one neat, rose-colored bow. There were some twists on the original story of Beauty and the Beast that I really enjoyed. For example, in the original story, the residents slash servants of the Beast's home are cursed and transformed into household items. However in Akita, rather than being transformed into household items, mask curse characters must wear masquerade masks, and have done so for 50 years since the curse was placed on the night of a masquerade party. I also appreciated that, though Tamlin was a beast, that quality did not factor into the curse that was placed on him. Rather, as a fey, he has the power of shape-shifting, and takes the form of a beast, usually when fighting. So, throughout most of the book, Tamlin is portrayed as a glorious, chiseled, man of steel. Some readers believe that the fact that Tamlin is gorgeous retracts from the beauty in the beast storyline. However, no one writes hot male love interests like Sarah J Maas, so I am not complaining about Tamlin at all. 
Overall, I found that I loved the fairy tale background of this story more than anything. I enjoyed drawing comparisons between Ma's story and characters, and the story I grew up with. Ma's world is so intriguing, engrossing you from the very beginning and never letting you go. Genre While we know that Akita is a fairy tale retelling, that is not to say that it is a children's book. I went into this book thinking that it was young adult. However, there is a particular scene that takes place after the great ride on fire night, such a good scene, by the way, just wait for it, that made me take a step back and think whoa. This is way too sexy and erotic for young adult literature. Looking back at Goodreads, I found that the book was listed as young adult and new adult. But, I would personally classify this book as new adult. Having read many new adult novels, I found that the sex rating for Akita resonates with that of a new adult novel. I think that there is a lot of confusion about the genre of this book because we all know Sarah J Maas as a young adult author. I personally have no problem with this genre. However, for parents who are giving this book to their young children, or for those readers who don't enjoy sex scenes in their books, you have been warned. I love the new adult genre, and discovering that Akita fell into that genre made me love it even more. I appreciate the more mature content, and that the characters are closer to my age, Faya is 19. And, hey, I appreciate the sexy times, too. There is no shame in my game. Because, who am I kidding? I have no game, I had also never read a new adult fantasy before, so I was glad to be exploring new territory. I'm absolutely impressed with Mars as a writer. She is not afraid to be different, to venture out to new places. I love that she is entering this new genre, and look forward to seeing what else she has up her sleeve for the future. Faya, the protagonist. When I started reading Akita, I was sure Mars was going to give us another Selena Sardothian, a badass girl who is nearly invincible, yet lovable and cool. However, Faye, pronounced Faye Ru, is so different from other fantasy protagonists I have read, because she is so unapologetically human. She is normal, and she is flawed, and I found that I could easily relate to her character. Faye is unlike the female protagonists we are accustomed to. She is no fighter, not outstandingly gorgeous, and she is also illiterate, a shortcoming that embarrasses her to not end. In the beginning, Faya is not very likable. She is cold, harsh, stubborn, and hard-headed. But, readers begin to see how her situation of poverty has shaped her to be that way. Once at the spring court, where she is no longer burdened with the responsibility of taking care of her father and two sisters, all of whom are ungrateful of her efforts to keep them alive, the ice in her heart begins to melt as she lives in comfort and takes up her passion for painting. Readers witness her character develop as she begins to rediscover happiness and life's simple pleasures. Faya easily becomes a character you can't help but root for and love. Tamlin and an impending love triangle Since we have discussed Faya, I believe that it is only appropriate to take a glance at her love interest, Tamlin. Tamlin is a Beifei warrior, with magical abilities. He is also gorgeous, kind-hearted, and strong. And, he places Faya's happiness and well-being above all else. But, he is not perfect. He is flawed, haunted by his family's past, by his own mistakes, and the lives he has taken. But, through all of that, he still strives to do and be good. However, I admit that while I love Tamlin, I am worried that Mars has a love triangle in the works for Book 2 of Akita. Because Reese and Reese, a sexy, dangerous Faye, is a force of nature who seeks to dig his claws, or rather, talons, into Faya. And, I can't say that I hate him. I actually like his character, although we witness him do some terrible things, even to Faya. He seems edgy, fun, and is incredibly witty. Masters this thing where she makes you fall in love with all of her characters, even the morally ambiguous ones, while Tamlin is all gorgeous and good, Reese has that hot but tragic thing going for him. I am already struggling with the love Square Mars has going on in the Throne of Glass series, between Selena and her three love interests, Kaol, Dorian, and Rowan. I don't think that I will be able to handle the emotional roller coaster of another of her love triangles. But, I think that as long as no one else is introduced, as long as this does not move into the quadrilateral stage, everything will be fine. Supporting Characters while Mars' main characters are at the center of attention, her supporting characters keep this book afloat. With less focus and fewer appearances, Mars' supporting characters still manage to steal our hearts in the show. First, there is Lucian, the red-haired, one-eyed Faye who is Tamlin's best friend. 
He is initially rude to Faya, but eventually warms up to her. They easily develop a sort of big brother little sister relationship. I would consider Lucian to be the story's comic relief. He is humorous and sarcastic and I adore his character. There is also Amarantha, the story's evil villainess. She is a fey ruler who has a particular hatred for humans, which is not good for Faya. She is cold, calculating, and cruel. But she has a backstory, all the best villains have backstories. And, I don't want to spoil you all, so I will just say that, when you learn her backstory, you realize why Amarantha is so harsh and unforgiving. Although, while I can sympathize with her on some level, I find her evil ways to be too much at times. However, I still find her to be an interesting, well-written character. And of course, there is Recent, whom I mentioned earlier. He is incredibly important to the story of Book 1, and will have an even larger presence in Book 2. I cannot wait to learn more about his character, because he is so enigmatic and intriguing and I just know that I am going to love him. Honorable Mentions Mass Writing I believe that Akatar is Mas at her best. As I stated earlier, we are definitely seeing Mas hone and perfect her skill, each book she releases is always better than the last. What I liked most about Mas writing in Akatar was her use of first person. Throne of Glass is written in third person, and with changing character perspectives. I find that I can tend to get bored with certain characters. But, with Akatar, told from Faya's perspective, I felt engaged throughout the entire book. Fairy World I literally want to live in Prithian, in the world of the Fae that exists beyond the wall, just without all of the drama. Mars depicts the spring court so beautifully and vividly. It seems like a literal heaven on earth. Other than the beauty of the Fae world, there are the parties and festivities. I mentioned Fire Night and the Great Rite earlier, two very interesting festivities held in the Fae world. And then there are parties and gatherings celebrating the seasons, such as summer solstice and midsummer. It is also fantastical and fun, readers are just dying to step into the pages. There is not much else I can say about A Court of Thorns and Roses. I love this book. I have no idea how I am going to wait an entire year for the sequel. It's going to be excruciating, but I am sure that it is going to worth it. Because Sarah J Maas is a fabulous queen of writing, and every word she writes turns to gold. I bought the trilogy. Altogether they were the best books I've read in a while. Separately, they were not perfect but I'm okay with that. I read a lot and tend to dislike books that show no character growth, or have wishy-washy villains, or have insta-love, or have love result from H saving H from sexual violation, or suffer from deus ex machina. I don't particularly care if something is obvious because sometimes I want to read something that is easy and obvious. My brain doesn't want to be challenged 24-7. Also, I love good dialogue dialogue makes a romantic connection feel real rather than insta-lovey. Is dialogue action packed? No. Does it slow down pacing? You bet. At this point, you're probably wondering where this review is going. Well, I think that knowing more about me as a reader might make it easier to see slash relate to my views for this book. Now the fun stuff. Spoilers. Faya, the H. This character is complex and goes through several changes throughout the series. In this book, she has her ups and downs. Initially, she is hardened, street smart and capable with a cynical eye toward romance and happiness and outright hatred and prejudice towards the Fae. She also has love for a family who seems to dislike and neglect her. She is not very likable. But does that make a book bad? No. Hello, Wuthering Heights, it is, however, more rare to write an H this way because readers in general tend to want to relate to an H, particularly when it's written in first-person perspective. So many readers might not be able to get into the story because of their dislike for Faya. When the far remove her burdens that largely drove who she was, Faya changes. She doesn't have a purpose to keep her going, to shape her. The pacing of the book suffers a bit here while she tries to sort herself out. She tries to make love and painting her new purposes, and while she has the determination to do so, the fit just isn't right. Does this make the book bad? No. While many people won't like to read about an H that seems somehow less this downward arc was necessary to fuel the inevitable reversal toward a more fitting purpose. It drags a bit for sure, but makes the reversal feel more right, more true later on. Did she rush into something with Tamlin? Her feelings do feel a bit rushed but ultimately fit her as a character going all in has always been her style from the start. In that sense, the character is consistent. 
Also, her reluctance to voice her love made me think that deep down she might have confused love with gratitude. Tamlin was her savior in many ways. For all of these reasons I liked Faya. I'd make it easier to see slash relate to my views for this book. Tamlin, the H. Tamlin was the first high Fae Faya had any meaningful interactions with in the first book. I never really liked him as an H. He was pretty but basically hollow. He struggles with uncontrolled rage. He had just as much hatred for humans as Faya did for Fae, and his elitist attitude was hinted at throughout this book, though not substantiated until book 2. He also adheres to Fae tradition in weird ways his willing participation in the Fire Knight ritual is distasteful because it borders on infidelity, especially since we later learn in book 2 that he can designate a replacement. Tamlin has from the beginning been primarily focused on Tamlin. When things get tough, he sends Faya away, he doesn't consult or listen to her, but just decides, hinting at his desire to treat her like a possession rather than a person. When he gets a moment of freedom under the mountain he attempts to have sex with Faya, his wants, instead of trying to escape with or save her, her needs. When Faya is dying, he can only bring himself to beg for her life, he isn't moved into action. All of these things hint that Tamlin is not a good fit for Faya. Many readers will not like to read about an H that is so lacking slash ill-fitted. The beautiful part is that these things are only ever hinted at in the writing, not outright stated so you will want to root for Tamlin, while also feeling something inexplicably lacking in him. I thought about it lots before I picked up book 2, where my thoughts regarding Tamlin were cemented. Tamlin could not have been written more likable though. If he was the perfect H then Faya falling for Reese in book 2 would have felt like a betrayal, instead of faded, and then Faya would have been worse than unlikable but detestable as an H. Lucian a secondary character who is both interesting and flawed. He hates Faya at first, but ultimately warms up to her. He is loyal to her faults, siding with Tamlin over and again, even when he thinks it is wrong to do so, a trait that becomes more obvious as the series progresses. Lucian has potential, Resand, villain slash other H. Resand was the most interesting character in the book, although Nesta was a close second. Reese was the evil queen's right-hand man, he has done terrible things. Yet, when we meet him, not my favorite bit of the book because of the gross circumstances I do not favor, as mentioned above, there is evidence that he is not all that he seems. He appeared to be interested in Faya romantically, but the why part is not there. Also, it is not 100% certain what drives his actions. He is a mystery. Why did he decide to help her time and again? Why, if he likes her did he decide to put her through nightly humiliation? Why use her to torment Tamlin? He is clearly not 100% a good guy. He is complex. Other things people often talk about. The sex. There is a lot more sex in this book than in other year books. It seems like that has somehow lead to some amount of controversy. I find that notion very strange as many eons ago when I was a teen, sex was a big part of being a teen whether or not to have it, who had it, when they had it where and how, what type of birth control to use, etc. Suggestions that a book would have any type of influence on those things are just silly. Teens have sex. It's a fact. Wishing it otherwise does nothing productive. Also, the sex in this series is not explicit. Every time I see this adjective used, it makes me laugh. I have read many romances and even some erotica. If you truly want something explicit check out erotica phrases like the apex of my thighs or that the length of him are not explicit. The copious dialogue. Lots of readers don't like the extended dialogue and also wish to have seen more of the fey world. I am just guessing here, but I am thinking that they are meaning that they wanted less talk and more fairy magic. But, fey are known for more than just their magic. Another key attribute of Faye has to do with their words being able to only speak in rhyme, only speak the truth, answer any question posed, etc. This attribute can be very interesting, see Mortal Instruments series or Dresden Files. And indeed it was put to use throughout the series, sometimes well done other times much too juice ex machina for my liking. Dialogue can be a type of action when done well enough. In this book, it probably could have been better but was good enough for me, the fire night and rape culture. Honestly, I am bothered by this one. I am never fond of rape or sexual violence as a plot device which is why I tend to avoid historical romances almost entirely. In this book, I think the Fire Knight ritual was used in part to explain a bit about Fae magic and in part to push forward the Fae Tamlin relationship while introducing Reese. I think it both went too far and not far enough. Tamlin's participation cheapens his feelings toward Fae. 
Just imagine someone saying, I love you, truly, but I need to go have sex with someone else. And then he came back to Faya after having sex with someone else, and bid her to clearly show his possession of her. It doesn't sit well, does it? Additionally, the three Faye with bad intentions suggest to Faya that Faye tradition gives them the right to violate her just because she is present. That makes all Faye seem brutal and detestable. Thus, it goes too far. But, what about the converse? The fire night ritual is supposed to be necessary to ensure the bounty of the land for the next year. But, the spring court is the only court that has slash observes this ritual en masse? That does not really make sense to me. The need for this ritual, especially considering mated bonds are a rare and extremely valued thing, is not properly explained. It really could have been omitted from the book and is one of the few things about the book that I truly did not like. The masks. Some people like them, some don't. The reason given for them was that they were yet another obstacle to a human girl falling in love with Tamlin. I really didn't mind them but I did not like Faya's reaction to the removal of the masks. While it was consistent with her character, she always had an eye for pretty guys, I thought that it cheapened her character to have her feel relieved that Tamlin was so pretty without his mask. It was very superficial, and further proof that there wasn't much of substance to their love. While book 1 is my least favorite of the series, I still really liked it and will definitely reread it again. Books 2 and 3 get even better and I am looking forward to further writings as well. Hopefully we will get to see what happens to Nesta, Elaine, the 6th Queen, and Braxis. So here I sit, having gone through the OMG Akatar series is amazing phase, and at the other end, I can sit back and think what the actual hell? I'm a huge Mars fan, so when I found out she was writing another series, I had to have it. For the first time in a long time, my library actually got the book within a month of its release, so I checked out Akatar and read it in a single day. I loved it. Books 2 came out, and while I was super disappointed in the pointless sex thrown in every so often and whole chapters dedicated to this nonsense, I continued reading because the story was compelling enough. And then Akawa emerged, and everything changed. This was a series I read numerous times before Akawa came out, and I saw things that genuinely bothered me, but I ignored them, I don't even know why, until I just couldn't stand it anymore. Akata is nothing more than erotica. I feel like the series as a whole started out with plans of being some sort of story porn that has a kick-ass plot with hot scenes thrown in for whatever reason, and then it got to Akawa and decided it wanted to be The Bachelor or a soap opera instead. The relationship between Tamlin and Faya greatly disturbs me. She's taking care of her family and he swoops in after she accidentally kills a Fae, who was disguised as a wolf in he woods where hunters hunt, and takes her away, claiming she's going to be in trouble and damned and blah blah. No, she's pampered and given servants and pretty clothes and good food. Tamlin dresses her up like a doll and makes snide remarks when she falls short of his goals, Faye goals, mind you. Faye is a human. Tamlin is Faye. He acts like her humanity is a curse or something to hold against her, and he constantly makes remarks about how she's too fragile, too uneducated, too plain, etc. Instead of fixing these issues, Tamlin does nothing other than tell her what to do and not do. He sexually assaults her after Kalanmai, and in the book Faya shows how much she does not want his advances, and he shoves her against the wall and bites her, then tells her not to ever go against him again. How is this okay? If my husband ever did this to me, I'd kick him in the crotch and leave. This is not okay. This is not a relationship. This is abuse, which is why it disgusts me that people go on and on about Tamlin. The fact that Faya and Tamlin have sex at a later time after he did this makes it worse. Why, Faya, are you going to throw yourself at a man who a, doesn't care about you based off his degrading comments and b, threatens you? Not only that, he basically blames her for a near-rape experience when he literally did nothing to look out for her and or stop the guys who were going to attack her. That being said, I have a lot of issues with Faya. She gets off too easy on everything, and it's like her brain is only wired to care if the dude is hot. You take care of your family, but then you walk into Tamlin's embrace after the things he has said and done. I understand she has been abused by this, but at the same time, she could have said no. Death is a lot better than basically being a sex slave or punching back to an immortal person determined to imprison you until you die. She's never punished for killing a Fae. 
Lucian and Tamlin tell her about magical creatures that could give her what she wants, and the next day she walks out and finds them, the elusive creatures, that are hard for Faye to find. Lucian is about the only well-developed character, and he's too sexualized sometimes for me to take me seriously. If you keep pointing out the abs, tan skin, or whatever on the dude, you're turning them into a slab of meat. All of the males, and truthfully the females as well, in Akatar are perfect in the idea of what today's society thinks is beauty, sexy, and amazing at everything. This is sexist on every account. Your characters become nothing more than fantasies which is why I say this is nothing more than porn slash erotica. Sure, you can get some great messages out of this series, but is it worth all of the dung in the way? Specifically with the later books, there's too much sex at some points for it to even be okay. Please, go try to have sex that many times or for days on end and tell me how that is. If you can do that, I'm sorry, but you're either a whore or you're just kinda crazy, because that's too much. Why I ever read this book and like it, I truthfully don't know, but I'm done with this series. I'm done with this fandom, and I'm fed up with seeing people swoon or make comments or even draw slash like it that mute art about literary characters. Guys, seriously. This is not a book for young girls, but when I went to the first, and last, mass event, most of the audience there were between the ages of 14 to 20, predominantly 15 to 17 years of age, and screamed when mass was mentioning sex scenes. I'm not going to continue to support a series that is encouraging young teens and young women to have unrealistic ideas of men as well as sexual fantasies, especially the married women who I've seen act this same way. If I were your husband, I wouldn't be able to deal with that. I wouldn't want those books in my house. About the only good thing I have to say for Akatar was that there actually was a plot in this book, and it was good, if insanely slow to get rolling, and the amount of sex was fairly minimal, so, whether you're a fan of fantasy, romance, or simply love immersing yourself in a richly imagined world, you're in for a treat. Subscribe to AudiobookTube and hit that notification bell, so you never miss an episode where we explore the most insightful perspectives on your favorite books. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the enchanting realm of A Court of Thorns and Roses. Get ready to dive into the world of fairies, magic, and forbidden love. Stay tuned for our upcoming discussions, reviews, and much more. Until then, may the pages of your favorite books be ever filled with wonder.